Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Varsity Tutors Star Course Series, where we are so excited to be rejoined by Education and Interpretation Specialist at the Science History Institute, Naomi Gonzalez, who is going to be giving us a super secret inside look into the clever and cryptic ways that spies throughout history have communicated in code. Now, before we get ready to build on our own spying skills, I want to make sure we're prepared with all the ingredients we need for a successful live class. And first, we're gonna look at some physical ingredients. So if you didn't get a chance to take a look at today's course outline, as a reminder, to participate in today's activity, you'll want to gather some water, baking soda, rubbing alcohol, turmeric, measuring spoons, paper, a paintbrush or Q-tip, and some cotton balls. And don't worry if you don't happen to have all of those ingredients close by. Uh, Naomi's gonna give us an inside scoop on some other alternative ways that we can build out our invisible ink. And we're gonna have plenty of opportunities for participation as well. So as you have questions throughout the lesson and as Naomi has some questions for you, feel free to use the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen to ask any questions that you have and to answer the questions she'll have for you. You'll also want to make sure that you have your cameras close by because toward the end of the lesson, we're going to have the opportunity to lean into the screen and pose for a selfie. And if you tag Varsity Tutors and the Science History Institute, you'll have the opportunity to win a Science History Institute swag bag with all sorts of fun items to further your spy savvy from a memory game and card deck to science projects and Science History Institute school supplies. And you'll also win a free enrollment to Varsity Tutors Curious World STEM camp. We'll talk more about that prize and how to enter properly toward the end of the lesson. But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and hand things off to your instructor for today, Naomi Gonzalez. Hey, everyone. Thanks for that introduction, Haley. And thank you again to Varsity Tutors and for all of you um, for having me again today. I'm so excited to be here for our second class. Um, again, I'm Naomi Gonzalez, the Education and Interpretation Specialist at the Science History Institute. Um, and the Institute is actually located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on 315 Chestnut Street. Unfortunately, we're closed right now, but you can explore more of our museum and our collections on our website at www.sciencehistory.org. And we are looking forward to welcoming you safely into our museum, hopefully soon. So today we're going to be talking about science and spies, uh, specifically during the Revolutionary War, right, the, the fight for independence. But before we start, I do have a question. So when the Revolutionary War, which uh, was eight years from 1775 to 1783, it was between the colonists and the British Army. When that began, who do, who do you think at that time would have won? The people that are living in the 13 colonies, the uh, uh, soldiers that are fighting for both sides, the people who are neutral, who don't want anything to do with the fight. During that eight years, who did, do you think they thought would win? So do you think it was A, the American colonists, B, the British and the British Army? Uh, C, do you think that some people were really just hopeful that we could compromise with England and the king and maybe prevent the war from continuing and just stop it all together? Um, or D, are we not sure? Um, so this is, this is one of those questions that you really got to put your thinking caps on, is we have been part of the British Empire for a very long time by the time uh, war started in 1775. So we had a very long relationship with the British crown. So when you're thinking about breaking with that relationship, people might not, they might not know who they're going to side with. So I see some some of the answers coming in, and there are there are a lot for the British Army, um, which makes sense. And I do see a couple for for the American colonists because we did. I mean, we were brave enough to uh, declare independence. Uh, so are are we brave enough to continue to fight and and win? So I see some of those answers coming through. It's kind of split. Most people think it's the British Army, but the actual answer is uh, D. We're not actually sure. Um, so commonly, uh, some historians state that about a third of the colonists were uh, pro-independence, what we would call uh, rebels or revolutionaries. 
Uh, about one third were pro the British crown. They were pro King, uh, King George III, who was on the throne during this period. Um, they were known as loyalists because they were loyal to the British crown. And then about another third were neutral. They really didn't have any thoughts on the war. They weren't siding either way. They just wanted to keep their head down, protect themselves, protect their families, and hopefully see through to the end. Um, however, this war lasted eight years. And colonist sentiments would and did regularly change throughout the duration of the war. Um, I did see a lot of answers for the British Army, and that makes sense because during this period, the British Army was one of, if not the most powerful army during the 18th century. And the British Empire was vast. It stretched across the globe and was essentially kept in check by their very well-trained and very well-funded army and navy. The 13 colonies, however, were mostly just made up of militias. And while many of the colonists had experience as soldiers, many of them fought alongside the British Army during the Seven Years' War, also known as the French and Indian War, which took place about 15, 20 years before the fight for independence. Um, but they were still outnumbered, outmanned, and outgunned by the time they decided to seek their independence and fight the king. So many of the early battles of the Revolutionary War ended in British victories. There were a lot who thought that maybe this war would be done by Christmas and that it would end with a victory for the British um, and for the king. Now battles can turn the tide of war and that happened pretty early on for the colonists. So the 10 crucial days um, was pretty successful for Washington's army. It ended with our uh, victory over British and Hessian troops, which really bolstered the colonists to continue their fight for independence and really bolstered reenlistment lists between 1776 and 1777. Um, we won the Battle of Saratoga in 1777, and that helped to secure a financial and military alliance with France. And that alliance would eventually lead to victory in 1781 at the Battle of Yorktown, which saw Lord Cornwallis and the British Army actually surrender to Washington and his troops, effectively ending the war and us gaining our independence. So battles can turn the tide, um, not just of war, but of colonist sentiments, of, um, sentiments as well. But intelligence and getting important information is just as important in winning a war as winning on the battlefield. Um, so the 13 colonies were spread out across thousands of miles, as were both armies, and they were tasked with creating military strategies, but also successful military strategies. You, you want to be able to win. You want to you want to either win your independence or if you're the British, you want to you want to win um, and put down this rebellion as you saw it. So in order to create successful military strategies, double agents, traitors and spies are very, very important to the cause so you can learn more about the enemy's plans. So let's put our thinking caps on and let's answer the next question. We're gonna pretend that you're a spy, but you're a spy for the British army. What kind of methods do you think you could use to sneak information about the enemy to say your commanding officer? Um, it, whether it's Sir Henry Clinton or, or Lord Cornwallis, they might need this important information about the enemy. So how are you gonna get that to them? Are you gonna use A, coded letters or ci and ciphers? B, something called a mask letter? C, invisible ink? or D, all of the above. And you really have to think about all the, the consequences if you're caught and you're tried as a spy. You will be hung, you'll be executed because espionage is illegal. Um, and that goes for both sides. So you have to um, pick a method that's going to be least likely to be found. You have to make sure you're not captured and that you can easily get through enemy lines to get that information from point A to point B. So what do you think um, is gonna be the best method to use? We do see, I see a lot of invisible ink because you can't see it, it's invisible, right? That's gonna be the best way to sneak that information across. Um, and there are a couple of coded letters. A couple of people realize that, you know, coded letters could work as well, but I see a lot of C, a lot of invisible ink coming through in the answers. Um, but the actual answer is D, all of the above. These are all methods that were used by spies for the British. Um, under Major John Andre, who was made the head of intelligence for the British Army in America in 1778, you could and probably were at some point using all of these different methods. Major John Andre 
successfully kept track of intelligence, which he gathered from American deserters. So colonists who were deserting the American cause and running toward the British lines. Um, he also got intelligence from British prisoners who escaped American lines or who were exchanged during prisoner exchanges. So he could, he could get information from them um, from their time behind enemy lines. As the quote unquote spy master, Andre instructed his network to use these different methods to sneak information on the rebels uh, to the British. So the next slide is actually gonna have some really great examples of these different kinds of spy methods. So we've got um, coded letters or ciphers. So a cipher is when um, you, you use real words, but you replace them with letters, symbols, or numbers in order to decode the letter the recipient needs a key. And that's gonna tell them what all those coded letters, symbols, and numbers really mean. You have a mask letter, which is a, a fully written letter, but the recipient, the person who, who you're writing to is gonna have a shaped template and they're gonna put that over the letter. And that little template is then gonna reveal what the true message of the letter is. So usually the letter and the quote unquote mask or the shaped template are gonna be sent separately so that the trick doesn't get um, found out. And then, of course, you also have invisible ink. So during this time, um, invisible ink usually consisted of a mixture of ferrous sulfate and water. And then the message would be revealed by, by either an acid or a heat source, uh, like the flame of a candle. Major Andre, in particular, instructed his spies to mark their letters that they were using invisible ink in with either an F for fire or an A for acid so that the reader knew whether they should use a heat source like their uh, candle, or if the letter needed to be treated with a chemical reagent, um, something like sodium carbonate uh, to read the message. The secret messages were often written in between the lines of what looked like an innocent letter, which made it harder to discover by the enemy. Now, Invisible Ink's letters had to be taken care of. They're very um, delicate if, if any water gets on them, if any kind of liquid gets on them, it could smear the invisible ink, making it near impossible to read. So they had to take great care uh, to protect these invisible inked letters. The most famous or well-known spy working with Major John Andre was Benedict Arnold, um, a name some of you might be familiar with. Um, he was a one-time general for the Continental Army. And Benedict Arnold conspired with John Andre to give up West Point, uh, which is a fortification. It's located on the Hudson River in New York. And he was going to give that up to the British. Unfortunately, uh, um, Andre met with Arnold. And as he was leaving, he was uh, captured by three New York militia men. And they thought he was suspicious. The, he had a pass on him from Benedict Arnold that said he was working with him and he was allowed to travel anywhere he wanted. And they didn't like how he was answering some of their questions. So they searched him. And what they found were different documents pertaining to West Point including a map of West Point. So he was quickly arrested. Uh, men were sent out to also arrest Benedict Arnold, but by that point he had already abandoned his post and made it safely behind British lines. So he was safe, but Major John Andre was not. He was found guilty of espionage and he was hung as a spy on October 2nd, 1780 in Tappan, New York. So um, I wanna bring back up the slide with the three um, images of the uh, methods. And I just wanna talk more in detail about what you're actually looking at here. Now, these are primary source documents. These are actual letters that were written in these different methods that we still have um, to look at. Um, these are the downloaded images, so you can even explore them online. It's really awesome. Um, but let's start going um, from left all the way to the right. So on the far left is a coded letter from Benedict Arnold to Major John Andre. The key used to decipher his message was going to be a standard published book, something that both men uh, not only would know, but could also have and have read on their person. So it would either be Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England or Nathan Bale's Bailey's Dictionary. So these are pretty innocuous books. You know, no one's going to think twice if you're walking around with either of these books, which makes it um, even easier not to get caught with, um, with a code or a key. So it might be hard to see, but this entire letter is coded in three-digit 
um, in a series of three digit numbers. So when writing the letter, Arnold would write down the page number, the line number, and the number of the word counting over from the left um, from either of these books using a series of three numbers, which would um, equal one word. So this entire page, this entire letter is a series of numbers and you'll see numbers like 26.9.8 or 177.9.28. And each series of numbers would relate to a single word. Um, so that is a coded letter slash cipher. The two middle images are actually a letter from Major John Andre to Sir Henry Clinton. He was the commander of the British forces in America starting in 1778. And this letter um, Andre wrote just before um, he was executed for, for espionage. And it might be hard to see, but in the upper left corner of the letter, there's a kind of a small red dot and what looks like a very faint letter A. Uh, the image in the front, I uh, pr try to put a filter on so that you could maybe see the A a little easier. Um, but that lets Sir Clinton know that he needs an acid in order to reveal the invisible inked message that Andre put in this letter. And it's not supposed to be super easy to see. You don't want this to be captured and then you see just an A or an F in the corner. It should be light enough that it, that'll it pass, but dark enough that the reader can see it. So hopefully you guys can see kind of that faint A in that upper left corner. And then all the way to the right, we have um, examples of a mask letter. So I mentioned you would write an innocent looking letter and then the recipient, the person that was gonna be reading that letter would have the shape template. So the image on the top right is the shape template, kind of just weird, almost teardrop, but kind of curved on the top. And um, that would be sent separately from the letter and your recipient, the person you wrote this letter to would take that um, shaped template, place it over the letter. And then the image on the bottom, you can see how that would look over the letter and that, in that space is gonna be the true meaning and message of the letter. So the writer, the spy writing this, had to take great care that his letter made sense with and without this shaped template. Because you, if, if one was captured as opposed to the other, no one would think anything of it because the letter would just be correspondence between two people. So you had to take great care to make sure they made sense. So these are some examples and methods that were used by those who were spying for the British. But what about the Continental Army? So now we're gonna pretend, we're gonna imagine that we're a spy for the Continental Army. So you're spying for Washington and for uh, his troops. Do you think you're gonna be using the same methods that spies for the British Army would be using? So think about that, we're in a war, we're in a war with a very, um powerful army being a spy is very dangerous we already saw what happened with major john andre when he was caught with very um <laughs> bad evidence no way he could talk his way out of that would we be using the same methods that the british were using would we be worried that they'd be able to find out our codes so seeing a lot of no's right because what if we're using the same codes what if they can easily decipher what we're writing. Do we want to use those same methods? So a lot of no's are coming in through the chat. Um, a couple of yeses, but mostly it looks like no's. And um, I understand where that comes from because you're right. Why would you want to use the same methods as the army that you're fighting against? But the actual answer is yes. We are going to be using the same methods that spies for the British are using because they are the best known techniques for espionage during this time. But they're going to be different between the two armies. So the ciphers and the, the coded letters and the keys or the books you're gonna to use to decipher and decode these letters are going to be different. The Continental Army is not gonna use the same uh, books or the same keys or the same codes that the British are gonna be using. So even though it's the same method, it's just different enough that if this correspondence was captured, the British, should not be able to decipher these letters and get this information that we were supposed to be keeping out of their hands. The invisible ink is also going to be different. So Washington, unlike Major John Andre, he didn't want his invisible ink to be read by an acid and a heat source. He didn't want 
a letter to be captured and then maybe they put it in front of uh, a candle to reveal the an invisible inked message. He wanted it strictly chemical based. So Washington sought the help of James Jay. Uh, he was a physician practicing in England, also brother of John Jay, who's a pretty important kind of political figure during this time in the uh, colonies. And he wanted him to develop an ink that would only reveal itself through a chemical reaction. So no heat source this time, only acids. So James Jay actually created a chemical solution out of something called tannic acid, and that would be used as the invisible ink. Um, and Washington often referred to this as the quote, sympathetic stain. And Washington encouraged all of um, the men on his spy network to use it. Um, and they used it far more than the British did. So the British did use invisible ink, but they used coded letters, ciphers, mask letters, and other methods more than they would have used invisible ink, as Washington would have used invisible ink more than any of the other methods. Um, if you were a spy for the Continental Army, you would have been part of what's called the Culper Spy Ring. So this spy ring was overseen by uh, Major Benjamin Talmadge, who was made director of military intelligence. So he pretty much uh, ran the spy ring and the men who were um, working in it. Uh, the ring was actually established in 1778. It ran for the last five years of the war um, until 1783, and it operated in and around New York. Uh, the British took New York pretty early on in the war and held it for the majority of the war. Um, and a lot of the Culper spy ring uh, lived in and around or operated in and around New York because that was pretty much the British base of operations. Um, so in order to get a good idea of um, troop movements, troop numbers, and different things like that, they wanted to keep an eye on New York. Uh, Talmadge set up a number system to keep the identities of his spies hidden, and it was pretty effective. Um, for the five years, none of the spies operating in the Culper spy ring were ever found out. Um, and it even Washington didn't know the identities of some of his spies. So even Washington, the general, uh, the man in charge of the Continental Army, um, didn't always know uh, the men that were spying on and getting him this important information. Um, some of the numbers to hide the identities of his spies, um, Washington, for example, he was known as uh, Agent 711. Uh, if you were talking about New England, uh, you would use 745. And if you're refer referencing New York, you would use 727. So this is just kind of an example of uh, what some of those numbers were. And what's interesting is that Benjamin Talmadge didn't actually think to use invisible ink until about 1779. So about a year after the Culper spy ring um, was put in motion, a um, couple of their correspondents had been captured by the British, and that's when they decided to start using invisible ink. Um, Washington wanted um, his men not just to use uh, invisible ink in in letters, you know, writing in between letters like the British were doing, but he encouraged them to write it in pamphlets. Um, if you have a book, maybe in that blank title page, you could write your, um, your message in the ink um, just to help make it easier to get this information, um, say, in and out of New York. Now, there are a couple of different ways that you can actually make invisible ink. So there are two different ways on the screen here that you're welcome to use. One of them you might have already done at one point. And um, we're going to do a third totally different method um, as well. So uh, the kind of classic, right, is the lemon juice, <laughs> lemon juice and heat. Um, so if you want to try writing an invisible inked letter and using a heat source, you can use lemon juice, either um, take a Q-tip or a paintbrush, dip it right into lemon juice, or you can add a couple of drops of water to dilute it a little bit. Um, write your message on a piece of paper. And then once the message is fully dry, you're going to take that paper and you're going to hold it over a heated light bulb. Now you don't want it to be too close. Um, you don't want to burn a hole in the paper um, or, and you don't want to hurt yourself because heated light bulbs can get very hot. Um, but you'll hold it over there, um, over the heated light bulb. And what's going to happen is that heat is going to break down the acid um, in the lemon, break down all those um, uh, carb, all that carbon. And when the carbon molecules hit 
air, it's going to oxidize, turning it into either a black or brown color. And that's what you're going to see your message come out as, that kind of black brown um, color. You can also do baking soda and grape juice. So baking soda is a base. You would mix it with water um, and write your message again on a piece of paper, either with a paintbrush or with um, a Q-tip. Let it fully dry. That's the key for all of the invisible ink here is it has to be fully, fully dry. And then you're gonna take a uh, cranberry juice, grape juice, any kind of really dark juice, um, which has an acid in it. And you're gonna you know, pat or paint over your paper and that's gonna reveal your message. So when, you, when an acid touches a base, you get a reaction and the reaction is going to be uh, revealing the, the message. What we're gonna do today is kind of a combination of both, um, but adding a third, ingredient. So uh, let's turn on this video here. Okay. So we're going to be using baking soda, water, rubbing alcohol, and turmeric to work out our invisible ink message. So the first thing you're going to want to do, um, if you have uh, an older person, uh, older sibling, parent, grandparent, older cousin, uh, you'll want to make sure you have an extra set of hands there um, just for, for help, uh, but also just to make sure everything, everything runs smoothly. Um, but the first thing you're going to need is half a cup of water and one tablespoon of baking soda. So we have our water here and our uh, one tablespoon of baking soda. Make sure you have baking soda and not baking powder. And what you want to do is you want to mix well. So we're going to empty this in here. And I'm actually gonna use this to mix. You can use a spoon if you want. Um, this is just easier since it's already here. And you wanna mix that really, really well. Okay. So it's gonna look a little cloudy because of um, the baking soda and that's okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to grab, I'm grabbing a little paintbrush here, um, just makes it easier. But again, you can use a Q-tip if you have that, um, anything that, that'll help you write. And then you're going to take some paper. So I have blank printer paper. But if you have an old book, if you have old book sheets, if you have anything that you maybe want to try and write your secret message in, similar to what um, Washington had his men do, or if you want to go the British way, if you're a loyalist, if you're loyal to, to the crown, uh, write a, an innocent letter and then you can write your secret message in between the lines of that. Um, so a good tip is not to saturate the paper um, a lot. So you don't want to put too much water on the paper, just enough to write, but you want to make sure that it dries and it dries relatively quickly. So now I'm not going to tell you what my secret message is. That's why it's secret. And you don't have to tell me what your secret message is. So just kind of think, who are you going to be writing this message to? And what secret do you want to share with them? Is it a password to a clubhouse? Is it a secret um, recipe for something? Do you have a hiding spot for all your favorite snacks and you want to share it with one person, but you don't want other people to know? Whatever it is, that'll be the secret message that you're writing with your invisible ink. So let's start writing. You will have to dip back in multiple times. And you might also need to occasionally stir in case the baking soda starts to settle. It can be a short message. It can be a long message. It could be abbreviated. Do you have your own codes or language with your friends? You can write that in the Invisible Week as well. You know, make it shorthand. Okay, and then once you're done with that, you'll put that off to the side. 
Now, this needs to fully dry and the drying can take anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, if not longer, but definitely not shorter. So in order for this to truly work, you have to make sure it's completely dry. You'll also wanna make sure you keep it away from any moisture. Don't spill any water on it. Don't get any kind of liquids on it because then it'll smear what we just wrote in the invisible ink and it could make it harder to read the message once you reveal it with the reagent. So we're gonna put this to the side. Now, I don't expect you to have a message right away um, because I, I have a couple of secret messages already written that have dried, but I do wanna show you what it looks like once we mix up that reagent and we use it to reveal our message. So put this to the side, somewhere away from water and other liquids. And the next step is making the chemical reagent, the solution that's gonna reveal our secret message. So what I have here is half a cup of rubbing alcohol. Um, now this is very powerful in terms of smell. So make sure uh, wherever you're doing this, you're, it's well vent ventilated. Maybe don't open a window today, it's pretty hot out, but I have my kitchen fan on just to kind of help with airflow there. So make sure you have some kind of fresh air. And then you also need one teaspoon of turmeric. Now turmeric's a spice. Uh, you might find, you might have it in your cupboard. You'll find it at your local grocery store. Um, and now it's gonna help us reveal our secret message. So just like we did before, you wanna dump this in and you wanna mix well. Mix it nice and well. If there are any chunks, don't let it get to the side. Okay. Now, the one thing you want to be careful of, as you can already see, it's a really nice yellow color. Turmeric can stain. So wherever you're making your visible ink and your uh, chemical solution to reveal it, uh, try not to spill too much. Try not to get any on your clothes. If you get it on your hands, wash uh, with soap and water pretty quickly, just to try and prevent as much staining as possible. The next thing you're going to do is get a, um, uh, excuse me, a cotton ball. So I've got a nice fluffy cotton ball here. And then we've got our secret message. So make sure that's there. What you wanna do, you wanna be very careful, try not to spill. Um, you're gonna take your cotton ball here and you're gonna to wanna to dunk it just a little bit, just enough. See, we got it kind of saturated there. Oh, already leaking, so be careful. And then what you wanna do is you wanna pat it over your secret message. All right, let's see. Whoa, wow, look at that. That is awesome. So what does our secret message say? Our secret message says, meet near the dock Friday, half past seven. Mm, I don't know what's going on near the dock, but better make sure we're there on time or we're gonna miss out on whatever information this person wants to give us. Now, what happened here was that we had a chemical reaction. So let's move this, make sure we throw this out, try not to drip on anything. I'm gonna try and get some of the yellow out of my fingers there. So what happened was we had a chemical reaction between the baking soda and the rubbing alcohol. So the baking soda is what uh, we know, uh, what's called a base. Um, and then the rubbing alcohol is of course the acid. And when they mix together, they create a chemical reaction, which causes a change in the color. So the invisible ink is no longer invisible. The turmeric is what's called an indicator. And indicators can change colors when they react with a base. So for us, that would be the baking soda. So we have the acid mixing with the base, and an indicator reacting to the base as well, which is why our uh, secret message went from being invisible to this really nice red, red orange kind of color. So depending on which method you use, your secret message might look a little different. If you do lemon juice and a heated light bulb, which could take a few minutes for the full, full message to reveal itself, that's gonna look a little more like a black brown ink. If you use grape juice, that's going to come out, uh, you know, maybe more red and purple. And then turmeric is going to have a more red, orange, or orange, as I like to call it, um, 
for your message. So each one will react differently and you'll see, you'll see that in the color of, um, of your message. So if you don't have this right here, that's okay. Um, soon as your paper dries, as soon as your full message dries, this will be what your secret message looks like. So I know we're going to uh, take a quick selfie. So if you, if you were able um, to dry your message and reveal it with, uh, with our uh, turmeric here, definitely show it off. If not, show off your invisible ink message and maybe people can guess what you might have um, written before you actually reveal the message to, uh, to everyone else. All right, that is so awesome. And to give students just a moment to maybe wash their hands, make sure they've got the turmeric off of their fingers and get ready yep. for that selfie. Uh, just <laughs> as a quick reminder to everybody, if you post those selfies on Instagram and you know, if you're, if you're feeling okay with sharing that secret message, if you've got it already, by all means, include it in that selfie. Uh, if you tag us on Instagram and you tag the Science History Institute, you'll have the opportunity to win that swag bag that I talked about just a moment ago and a Curious World Camp subscription. Now, it's just a little bit more detail there. That Curious World STEM camp is a part of our virtual summer camp series. It is a one-week camp where you'll have the opportunity to learn more about all of the secrets of how the world works using science and technology. We'll be doing that through small group activities, unplugged challenges, projects, and various challenges in the Varsity Tutors Learning Lab with some featured celebrity content. I'll have those Instagram tags on screen for everybody at the close of the lesson, but I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back over to Naomi to show off that, that secret message and get ready for that selfie. All right. So here we are. As you can see, it does fade just a little bit, which is perfect for an invisible message. You know, it's kind of kind of like the cartoons. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. It'll maybe start to get a little uh, a little faded and that'll prevent the enemy from finding out what your secret is. So that works in our favor too. So as soon as you guys are ready, here we are. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Naomi. And if you didn't get a chance just yet, uh, we've got just a couple more minutes left for Q&A. And Naomi is very excited to answer all of your questions and will be here smiling along as well. Uh, and our first question is actually one that will, Naomi, sound very, very familiar to something we were asked last class. So for those of you who didn't have a chance to join in Naomi's alchemy lesson, I very strongly suggest that you go and check it out. It's on our YouTube page. It's a blast. We had an interactive activity then too that was a lot of fun. Uh, we had some students who were pretty keen to, to pick up on some of the similarities in our images in today's lesson who were again kind of wondering, were all the spies men? What about the women and children? That's a really great question. And I'm really happy that, that everyone picked up on it. So um, if anyone is familiar with the show Turn on Netflix, that uh, TV show is based on Washington spies. It's based on the culprit spying. It's not 100% accurate. Um, but it gives you a look at the men that were part of the, the ring, like uh, Benjamin Talmadge and Abraham Woodall, uh, and some of the other men that were taking this information into and out of um, uh, different parts of New York. Uh, now, the one thing you'll notice in that show is that some of the men, like Abraham, uh, is married with children, and that would not have happened. A lot of the men, in fact, I would say all of them that were in the cult perspiring were single. They did not have wives or anything like that because if they were caught, they would have been executed um, for espionage, which would have left their wife and children without anyone to care for them. Now we do know that there were some women who were spies, but we don't have as much evidence to what they possibly did the way we have with the men. Um, we do know some women, because during this period we're seen as um, really not important. There are men that didn't think we'd understand military strategy. So we can kind of weave in and out of these really important conversations and pick up little tidbits of information. And maybe we write that down on a piece of paper and kind of sew it in our uh, petticoat, which is what we would uh, women would be wearing at the time. And then we can very innocently cross um, uh, enemy lines and then kind of sneak that information to um, one of the troops under Washington. Um, the British did have, I know, of two women that were British spies. Um, one was a Miss Jenny. Uh, we don't know much about her as a person. We don't know what her uh, backstory is. 
but she uh, infiltrated American and French uh, troops by pretending to look for her husband who supposedly left Canada for France and she thought he was there. And they thought she was a little um, sus as the youth say, they, they suspected her of, of something and they questioned her, but she stuck to her story for the two to three days that she was in those camps. And then they kind of kicked her out. And the two or three days that she was there, she picked up enough information that she immediately went back to the British and shared some of that information, including like the numbers of troops that were there and the number of weapons and weaponry that they had. Um, there was also an Anna Bates and she was a teacher in Philadelphia and she was kind of doing the same thing, weaving her way in and out of troop movements and um, getting all of this information a little less, sus, a little less sus, we should say, than Miss Jenny, um, and taking that information back to the British. There are rumors that Betsy Ross, who we all know, especially here in Philadelphia, as you know, the creator of, of the um, the very classic thirteen circle star flag. Um, there are some rumors that she might have been a spy for um, Washington in the army, but nothing that we can prove. Um, and there are some rumors that um, there were women who were spying for the British that were purposely finding ways to keep uh, American generals um, occupied long enough until they could get captured. Um, but we don't have as much evidence for female spies as we do for, excuse me, for the male spies that we have. But we do know that there were some. Absolutely. So it looks like everyone had the opportunity to jump in and, and be a part of the cause, regardless of what side of that cause they happen to be on. I hope you're all revolutionaries <laughs> and not loyalists. Although I would understand, because I, I, I mentioned the long history and relationship we had with, with the British crown, and it was very difficult for some people to separate from that because we did benefit as colonists um, very, very very much from being a part of the British Empire. So I can understand if you stayed a loyalist. Oh boy, just maybe, maybe you know, the, the loyalist messages can make, make their way out of the Instagram. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't tag us in loyalist messages. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's okay, Only we won't judge you too hard. We did win, so it's okay. <laughs> All right, I had a lot of students who were very interested. You know, if, if, if these were such successful spies, how do we know about the methods that they used? And, you know, if we figured them out now, were they ever figured out by people back in the day too? That's a really great question. So um, they were figured out back in the day. Um, Major John Andre, which I mentioned earlier, he was found out because unfortunately he was captured with very damning evidence. He had a map of West Point. It was clear he was working with, uh, with Benedict Arnold um, who made it to safety. And unfortunately, Major John Andre was executed for being a spy. Early on in the war, Nathan Hale, I believe it's 1776, he is caught in New York as a spy, um, spying for General George Washington. And he unfortunately is executed as well. Um, I believe there's, um, I'm gonna paraphrase a saying, I believe that's connected to him. Um, is, you know, he, he's only sorry that he only has one life to give for his country. It's kind of what he's quoted as saying before, uh, before he is hung. So um, there are women, uh, some of the women might've been captured. Um, although again, women aren't seen as, as anything important or anything that, should be, that people should be worried about during this time. But um, Miss Jenny, for example, they couldn't prove that she was a spy, but they thought she was suspicious. So her punishment was not just getting kicked out of the camp, but having her hair cut. Because during this period, women only cut their hair um, really if they were sick or as a form of punishment. So that was kind of a form of humiliation. Um, so there were some that were, that were captured, um, but not nearly as, as many as you think. And I, the, the best answer I have for why we know about them now is because um, their letters and their um, their codes and their code books survived. There's actually, you can download a PDF from Mount Vernon's uh, website of the Culper code book. And that'll show you what numbers related to what words. So if you, you know, were part of the ring and you wanted to write a letter to Washington to say, there are 30,000 troops uh, in New York and half of them are heading to Rhode Island, you would use this code book to find those words and then your entire letter might just be numbers like Benedict Arnold's was to Major John Andre. So a lot of that survived, they're very delicate, especially the invisible inked letters. Um, they're very, very fragile, but 
they survived somehow by some way and they came into into our possession and historians have done a really really great job of, of researching and really looking into into this history wow absolutely and it looks like we have some students who one have done their research ahead of time and two have some pretty keen spying abilities already going into today's lesson who awesome. are wondering uh we're wondering why is it that they chose to use numbers rather than actual fake names is there a reason why that was a sneakier or better process did that differ depending on who we're looking at in history that's really really great questions i I'm so excited that you guys are just into the spies because spies are awesome, um, you know, until they're caught. Uh, but there, so Benjamin Talmadge actually had um, a quote unquote fake name. Occasionally when he would reach out to Robert Townsend, who was um, operating in the middle of New York and, um, you know, per portraying himself as a loyalist, um, he would often put in orders at, um, at his establishment under the name John Bolton. So you would occasionally see that. But it was just easier to use numbers because no name is tied to anything or anyone. If you saw, um, you know, 711, you wouldn't know that that was General George Washington. But if you have a fake name and maybe you're looking at the area of where their letters are coming to and from, and you know, you have a general idea of where he might be with his troops, you might be able to put two and two together and figure out who this fake named person actually was. So it just made more sense to Talmadge and to the culprit spying to use numbers. And the fact that Washington didn't know who all his spies were as well, um, I think also helps because if he were to be captured, he can't really give up the spy ring because he doesn't really know who's in it. Um, Major John Andre knew all of his networks. He knew all of, um, of who was involved. And it's one of the reasons why he got discovered because he was, with Benedict Arnold with this um, information as opposed to maybe going through a third party or just writing in coded letters. So it ultimately is just easier if you're using numbers as opposed to names because a name can be found out no matter how good you are coming up with a fake name, somebody can find it out, but the letters, are, uh, the numbers are going to be harder to find out. Absolutely. It looks like our students are going to have a whole lot of newfound spying knowledge that hopefully they're using only for good. Um, but it is about that time. So do you have any closing thoughts for our students around anything that we talked about today uh, or any closing thoughts for those interested in learning more? Yeah, absolutely. So the one thing I, I want to um, emphasize is something like Invisible Ink has been around for centuries. Um, it's been used in many different ways, especially in warfare. And we still um, use spies today. They don't look the same. We're not, uh, you know, using numbers and letters and things like that. But we are using coded language, as are um, other uh, countries and nations around the world. Um, there are a lot of books that have been written about the code breakers of World War II, uh, the Navajo code breakers, for example, who are using their language as code, but also being able to break other code. So these kinds of coded languages, ciphers, this kind of spying um, in various ways still continues today in order to kind of share that important information. Um, and it's also important to know that there are lots of other people um, involved in spying, even if they maybe weren't considering themselves spies. Uh, so, you know, neighbors who notice things and maybe happen to mention it to, to a, a, a general or a passing, a, a passerby or something like that, you know, sharing that information um, to get it across is, is kind of, it's, it's spy-like. So um, the history is there. It continues to be there. I look forward to see what spying looks like in the 21st and 22nd century, knowing uh, how far away we're gonna get from um, ferrous sulfate and more into you know, the digital part of the world with what the spy look like in the 21st century. Um, but if you're interested in learning a little bit more um, about the culprit spy ring specifically, definitely visit Mount Vernon's website. They have a lot there, including the PDF of the Culper Spy book that you could download. And then you can also visit, I know the website will, um, will be on the, on the last slide, but you can visit the Clemens Library. They put on a really great online digital exhibit featuring all of, well, most of Sir Henry Clinton's papers. So Sir Henry Clinton was the commander of the British Army in America um, starting in 1778. 
And a lot of his papers um, have things like invisible ink, uh, secret codes. You'll find some of the letters between Benedict Arnold and Major John Andre. So if you wanna download those or explore them, learn more about them, read more about the women um, that I mentioned, definitely visit their website as well. Awesome, absolutely. And yes, we'll have that link right on screen for you all in just a moment. In the meantime, I'd like to give one more great big thank you to Naomi Gonzalez and the Science History Institute for all of this fascinating knowledge and for the next steps that we can take a look at from here. We hope to see everybody back in another Varsity Tutors Star Course sometime soon. And in the meantime, we look forward to seeing those selfies and maybe a couple of secret messages along the way on Instagram. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Bye.